When federal troops marched into the city of New Orleans on May 1, 1862, they took control of the most important city in Louisiana and also one of the most important naval bases, port cities, and population centers in the South. But that is only part of the Union's grand strategy. As Lana and Winfield Scott's Anaconda Plan, the federal plan from early in the war is to blockade southern seaports and take control of the major rivers and waterways. This, the Union planners believe, will starve the South into submission. By controlling the Mississippi River, the Union can blockade the southern export of cotton, thereby eliminating a valuable source of revenue for the Confederacy. At the same time, Union forces can import supplies for themselves while denying Confederate access to food, medicine, and other supplies. Some people supplant themselves in history by overcoming significant odds, like Ulysses S. Grant, who rose from a store clerk to becoming the highest ranking general in his time. You can do the same in the free role playing game Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends just celebrated the third anniversary as one of the top RPG games out on the markets. From its humble beginnings to one of the leading mobile games, Raid has led the way in the genre. With hundreds of champions to choose from to the ever expanding Raid universe, there is plenty to try out on your own or with friends in the game, like the new faction Shadowkin, the new world Doom Tower, or the new hardest boss yet, Hydra. Raid has it all. There's also big news in the Raid world. They just released a super powered legendary version of everybody's favorite champion, Death Knight. He has proven to be perfect and is needed in everybody's list of champions. The best part is, he's free for anybody who plays Raid for 7 days between now and October 27th. Also, you can use the promo code DKRISES to get a bunch of free items to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to 50 and 5 star ascension. But that's not all. This month, Raid just released a giant new feature, Awakening in a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you're good enough to take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff. Being able to awaken your champions, awakening your champions lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transfer how they perform in battle. If you want to play Raid Shadow Legends today, you can get the game by either using the QR code on the screen or using my link down in the description where you can play it either on PC or phone. New players who download it today can get a free starter pack worth of almost $30. You can find the rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Control the Mississippi River, Union leaders know, means controlling the major cities and towns on the river. New Orleans, Donaldsonville, Baton Rouge, as well as the Confederate stronghold upriver from Baton Rouge at Vicksburg, Mississippi. When Louisiana seceded from the Union on January 26, 1861, State militiamen quickly took control of the Baton Rouge Arsenal in Ordnance Depot, now known as the Pentagon Barracks, seizing it from the federal government. Built on the east bank of the Mississippi River in Baton Rouge in 1816 and refurbished in 1838, the Ordnance Depot includes an arsenal and barracks, making it strategically valuable to both sides. After securing the depot for the Confederacy, troops gradually left Baton Rouge when they were drawn into fighting elsewhere. As a result, Baton Rouge has few defenders in 1862, making the state capital an appealing Union target. Having secured New Orleans, part of Union Flag Officer David G. Farragut's gunboat fleet heads up the Mississippi River. In response, members of the state's Confederate government flee from Baton Rouge and establish what they hope to be a temporary capital in Opelousa. To prevent Union troops from capturing cotton and liquor, cotton bells are lined up along the Baton Rouge levee, doused with liquor instead of fire. On the evening of May 7, 1862, Union Navy Commander James S. Palmer reaches Baton Rouge aboard the six-gun sloop of war USS Iroquois and demands that the city and its 7,000 inhabitants to surrender. Baton Rouge Mayor Benjamin F. Brown replies, The city of Baton Rouge will not be surrendered voluntarily to any power on earth. He acknowledges that the town is entirely without any means of defense, but insists nonetheless that it would have to be taken without the consent and against the wishes of the peaceable inhabitants. Commander Ponder later reports to Farragut, who has remained in New Orleans, that he regards the mayor's arrogant reply as nonsense, and on May 12th, weighed anchor and steamed abreast the arsenal, landed a force, took possession of the arsenal, barracks, and other public property of the United States and hoisted over it the Union flag. There is no resistance from the people of Baton Rouge. Nonetheless, Palmer sends a second note to the mayor to warn him that the flag must remain unmolested 
though I leave no force on shore to protect it. The rash act of some individual may cause your city to pay a bitter penalty. This warning falls in deaf ears. The Iroquois is called away to Vicksburg in an effort to take control of the city. There, Union Navy Captain Samuel Phillips Lee, cousin of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, demands the surrender of Vicksburg to his federal forces. Not only does Vicksburg refuse, but unlike Baton Rouge, the city has the means to defend itself. Nevertheless, during the Union troops' absence in Baton Rouge, a group of rebels ripped down the newly hoisted United States flag. This episode is Baton Rouge's first brush with federal troops. The interactions between the city and the occupying Union soldiers are, for the most part, civil, and correspondence to superiors. Commander Palmer boasts how the mayor and the other local authorities are courteous and gentlemanlike. Flag Officer Farragut himself arrives in Baton Rouge later in the day aboard his flagship, USS Hartford, and the first Union troops to reach the city, 1,500 men of the 2nd Brigade, Department of the Gulf, commanded by Brigadier General Thomas R. Williams, arrive on the afternoon of May 13th. Their ultimate destination is Vicksburg, but they do disembark from the steamers long enough to make a show of force by marching to the arsenal and back to the boats before continuing upriver the next morning. It is a far different situation when the Union fleet reaches the city of Vicksburg. Some 8,000 Confederate troops rush in to defend the town, putting heavy guns high on the bluffs overlooking the city. From that vantage point, the artillery can bombard any Union vessel trying to get to the city. Realizing that it would take more men and firepower than he has, Farragut orders six boats to stay behind to block the river, and turns the Hartford and several other gunboats back to Baton Rouge. When Farragut's little fleet arrives in Baton Rouge on May 28th, a band of about 40 Confederate guerrillas fire on the Hartford's chief engineer and four sailors as they row towards the Baton Rouge landing. In retaliation, Farragut orders the Hartford and Kennebec to shell the city. Only one person is killed, but several are wounded, and the damage to the buildings near the river is extensive, particularly to the Louisiana State Capitol building, the Harney House Hotel, and St. Joseph's Catholic Church. Farragut makes his point, but the incident also persuades the Union commanders that the city can no longer be left unoccupied. Brigadier General Williams and his troops return to Baton Rouge on May 29th, take over the Ordnance Depot, occupy the state capitol building, and pitch tents on its grounds. With Baton Rouge apparently secure, Farragut leaves two gunboats to support the troops holding the arsenal and goes back to New Orleans. Shortly thereafter, Brigadier General Williams takes the bulk of his men back upriver for another try at Vicksburg leaving a handful of troops in Baton Rouge. The second Union attempt at taking Vicksburg meets with no more success than the first, and General Williams is ordered back to Baton Rouge in mid-July. The Union withdrawal frees Confederate troops at Vicksburg for other duties, and on July 27th, Major General Earl Van Dorn, commanding Confederate forces defending Vicksburg, gives orders to Major General John C. Breckinridge to march south from Vicksburg with fewer than 4,000 men in his corps and drive the Union forces from Baton Rouge. At the same time, a small Confederate fleet led by the ironclad ram CSS Arkansas heads down the river to provide whatever help it can. To do that, the Arkansas runs to the Union blockade that Farragut has placed below Vicksburg, fighting a famous two-hour battle on the Yazoo River after which its commander, Lt. Isaac M. Brown, reports that the ram has done much injury to the Union fleet. Meanwhile, Breckinridge's corps moves by route to Camp Moore in Tangipahoa Parish marches his army to Greenwell Springs and then the Baton Rouge, where federal troops are concentrated along a parade field between Government Street and North Street. Breckenridge believes that the Union forces of 5,000 are much larger than his own of about 3,400 and that the Union troops are reinforced with three gunboats. He also knows that his own men are exhausted from fighting at Vicksburg. Breckenridge decides not to attack Baton Rouge until his forces can be protected against the fire of the Union gunboats in the river. When he is assured that the Arkansas will be at Baton Rouge by daylight of August 5th, Major General Breckinridge begins to plan the Confederate attack. His troops arrive at the Kamite River, 10 miles from Baton Rouge, on the afternoon of Monday, August 4th. With men dropping out all along the way because of heat and illness, they reach the outskirts of the state capital a little after midnight on the morning of August 5th. Breckinridge estimates that, because of all the illness, he will enter the coming battle with no more than 2,600 men. Breckinridge's corps includes regiments from Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama, divided into two divisions. 
Brigadier General Charles Clark's division is positioned on the Confederate right on the north side of Greenwell Springs Road. Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles' division is assembled on the south side of the road. On the Union side, Brigadier General Williams commands troops from Connecticut, Indiana, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Vermont, and Wisconsin who take defensive positions with their backs to the river. While the Union appears to have a numerical advantage, practically none of Williams' troops have ever been in battle before. The Confederate forces, in contrast, are mostly veterans of the Battle of Shiloh in southwest Tennessee. More recently, many have been involved in the defense of Vicksburg the previous month. The Battle of Baton Rouge begins at dawn on Tuesday, August 5, 1862, with the launching of the Confederates attack on the Union camp in front of the city. Major General Breckinridge marches down Main Street with Clark's division on his right and Ruggles' division on his left. The sudden movement of Confederate soldiers spooks the local wildlife as the rebels march forward for the attack. The Confederates approach march toward federal control Baton Rouge pushes the scared animals through the Union camp. The sudden movement of wildlife, along with the sound of gunfire off in the distance, confirms Brigadier General Williams' notion that the rebels would try to retake the state capital. The premature gunshots that alerts Williams to the oncoming Confederates are due to a small party of bushwhackers from the 9th Louisiana Partisans Rangers Battalion. The small party is advancing too quickly under the orders of Major James DeBon. Instead of stopping at Ward's Creek, as ordered, the 9th Louisiana Partisan Rangers continued down Greenwell Springs Road. The bushwhackers continued to advance until they happened upon picket post number 5 of the 21st Indiana, held by Captain R. Campbell of Company I. The Union troops fired a quick volley in the direction of the Rangers. Under the orders of Captain Tate, the party retreats to relay the newly found intelligence back to the Confederate command. The small group of Rangers reaches Brigadier General Benjamin H. Helms' 1st Kentucky Brigade, nicknamed the Kentucky Orphan Brigade, due to its ragtag soldiers being unable to return home to Union-occupied Kentucky. However, in the morning darkness, which is compounded by the settling of fog over the area, Helms' Orphan Brigade mistakes the Rangers for Union cavalry and begins to fire into the darkness. As Helms' Brigade mistakenly fires on their allies, the 9th Louisiana Partisan Rangers, in turn, mistaken Helms' Brigade for another Union picket squad. The dual cases of mistaken identity results in an exchange of friendly fire, but the mistake is soon realized, and a ceasefire is called. Unfortunately for the Confederates, the damage is done. During the barrage, the Partisan Rangers lose several men and horses to either death or wounds. Helms' Kentucky Orphan Brigade suffers even more. They lose Brigadier General Helm himself, who is badly wounded when his horse falls on top of him. He would eventually recover from these wounds, but during the rest of the battle Baton Rouge, Helm would be replaced by Colonel Thomas H. Hunt of the 9th Kentucky Infantry Regiment. On top of losing the brigade commander, the Kentucky orphans also lose two out of the three artillery guns supporting them from Cobb's Kentucky Battery when they are made unserviceable by horse teams that bolt and overturn the pieces. Another young soldier, 1st Lieutenant Alexander H. Todd of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry Regiment, half-brother of 1st Lady Mary Todd Lincoln and brother-in-law to President Abraham Lincoln, is killed in the exchange. The Battle of Baton Rouge lasts the greater part of the morning. Starting at first light around 6.30 a.m., the Confederates begin the battle with a jump on the Union. However, with a dense fog rolling in, it is difficult for the rebels to stay in formation. Ruggles' division steps off first from their positions in the open field south of Greenwell Springs Road. Colonel Albert P. Thompson's brigade forms the division's right flank, with Colonel Henry W. Allen's brigade on the left. In between the two brigade lines are the six guns of Captain O.J. Sims' Confederate regular battery, made up of four six-pounder field guns and two ten-pounder pair rifles. The 21st Indiana under Colonel James W. McMillan is one of the first Union regiments hit hard by the Confederate dawn attack. Their camp is the forward-most position of the Union garrison at Baton Rouge, and it comes under a hell musketry from Thompson's brigade. The 21st Indiana barely manages to form line and fires off a volley at the 35th Alabama before they are forced to withdraw from their camp, moving back down Florida Street. Thompson's and Allen's brigades pursue the 21st Indiana down Florida Street, pushing back the stunned artillerymen of 1st Lieutenant William W. Carew's 6th Battery, Massachusetts Light Artillery 
who are positioned behind the 21st encampment. Across the field, Sims' regular battery moves forward with the supporting infantry brigades before unlimbering after moving up half a mile. They then pour shot and shell into the stunned 6th Massachusetts battery. Being without support and about to be outflanked, Lt. Carruth orders the 6th Massachusetts battery to limber up and fall back slowly up the road to a new position from which they can fire. On the Confederate right flank, Charles Clark's division steps off for the attack a few minutes after Ruggles' division. Colonel Thomas B. Smith's brigade of Tennesseans and Mississippians hold the division's left flank. Pettus' Mississippi battery is to their right, in the division's center, and the Kentucky Orphan Brigade holds the extreme right of Breckenridge's entire battle line. They advance on the right side of the Greenwell Springs Road, encountering light opposition. The 14th Maine's camp is attacked by the Kentucky Orphan Brigade. The Kentuckians fire off a concentrated volley into the 14th Maine's camp, forcing back the New Englanders who reform into a line of battle on the corner of Gaines Street and Spanish Town Road. Back on the Union right, the 21st Indiana gains support in the form of the 7th Vermont and the 6th Michigan, who form into lines of battle besides the 21st position in front of the Magnolia Cemetery. By now, Brigadier General Williams is riding through his battle lines, leading the regiments in their positions against the Confederate attack. It is difficult to see anything ahead due to the thick sheet of fog looming over the city streets. Overall, the fog wreaks havoc and creates chaos for both sides. The Union Navy flotilla is sitting blind on the Mississippi River. Visibility is near zero, but the tensions are high. At any moment, the Union crews wait for the CSS Arkansas to burst out of the fog and ram into them. The Union is not yet aware, just like the Confederates, that the Arkansas is not going to burst out of the fog. All morning long, the Confederates are able to drive back each Union unit they encounter. It seems that the Confederates had the forward momentum to take back Baton Rouge. With the Rebels on their hills, the Union is forced to pull back from Magnolia Cemetery to a new defensive position closer to the river. In this position, the Union has the protection of the Federal Flotilla. The Union Navy gunboats on the river immediately begin shelling the Confederates. During the fighting retreat through Magnolia Cemetery, in which Union and Confederate troops battle across the city's historic graveyard, Brigadier General Thomas Williams is killed by friendly fire from the 7th Vermont and the thick mist of the fog and gunpowder smoke making it hard to see. Colonel Thomas W. Cahill replaces him as commander of the Federal Forces. Under the leadership of Colonel Cahill and the protection of Union gunboats, the Federals are able to hold their position. The Union fleet has been waiting in anticipation for the opportunity to contribute to the battle. The USS Essex and the captured former Confederate cotton-clad USS Sumter are located above the city and have clear fields of fire over the Bayou Gross. Both ships open fire on the Confederate left flank, but it is the powerful 11-inch guns of the Essex that causes most of the damage to the Rebel battle line. The three 9-inch Dahlgren guns hammer away at the Confederate left flank. As soon as it is safe enough to fire, the USS Canoe and the USS Katahdin open fire on the Rebel right. The combined barrage of the four ships decimate the Confederate ranks. Even with the Canoe and Katahdin firing their guns over the city, the shells are hitting their Confederate targets. Nevertheless, General Breckinridge holds the line. He knows that if his army is going to recapture Baton Rouge, he needs the CSS Arkansas to neutralize the Union Navy gunboats. The General is confident that all he needs to do is hold the line and wait. It is his heavy reliance on the Arkansas's participation that is a major flaw in Breckinridge's plan. The Rebel Ironclad will never make it to Baton Rouge. About 10 miles north of the city, the crew of the Ironclad catches sight of their Federal adversaries. However, just at that moment, the starboard engine of the battered and overworked Ironclad Ram fails. This mechanical failure causes the Arkansas to veer right, effectively tangling the gunboat in a series of submerged tree stumps along the Mississippi River's banks. The crew of the Arkansas can do nothing but listen to the sounds of the nearby battle as the ship's engineers rush to repair Breckenridge's only hope of success. As luck would have it, the Union flotilla is in the midst of shelling the city and does not notice a crippled Confederate ship. It takes a greater part of the day to get the Arkansas repaired and free from the riverbank. Though under constant fire in the city streets, Breckenridge and his men are hopeful of the Arkansas's arrival and continue to maintain their position throughout the afternoon. However, upon the arrival of a messenger from the ship, all hope is lost. Without the support of the CSS Arkansas, Breckenridge has little hopes in winning the battle. He proceeds to order his men to retreat, bringing it into the battle. 
Meanwhile, the Arkansas's troubles only worsen as mechanical failures continue to plague the vessel in its attempt to flee the scene upriver. Still wary of the Union flotilla just downriver from their position, the Arkansas's crews work as fast as they can to repair the mechanical problems with the ship. However, repairs take all night. Finally, on the morning of August 6, repairs are completed, but none of the crewmen are confident that the engines will last the journey home. Furthermore, the ship's commander, Lt. Henry K. Stevens, sights the USS Essex coming towards them from downriver, and the Union ironclads closing in on the Arkansas fast. Running out of options, Stevens orders the crew to make ready for battle, but once again the Confederate ironclad suffers an engine failure. This time, however, the Arkansas will not recover. Almost simultaneously, a pin snaps on the port connecting rod and the starboard engine simply stops working. The Arkansas is now dead in the water. As she draws near, the Essex fires on the Arkansas, and though the ship's crew attempts to return fire, they quickly realize that the Essex is out of range of the Rebel Ironclad's guns. The Arkansas drifts to the riverbank once more, and Lt. Stevens finally makes the decision to scuttle the ship. He orders his men to abandon the once feared Ironclad, leaving a small scuttling party to destroy the ship. The scuttling party loads the guns and set the ship ablaze. To mark the end of its brief military career, the CSS Arkansas explodes and vanishes into the Mississippi River, where she rests to this day. The crew of the scuttled ship begin to move inland to avoid capture and make the long journey back towards Confederate lines on foot, horseback, and in wagons before finally reaching Camp Moore in northeastern Louisiana. The Battle of Baton Rouge on August 5, 1862 ends in a major Union victory. Casualties for the battle include 371 Union losses in killed, wounded, or missing while the Confederates lose 478 men in total. John C. Breckinridge's attempt to recapture Baton Rouge for the Confederacy has failed, and the Federals will maintain control over the Louisiana State Capitol for the duration of the war. Meanwhile, the Confederates will move north from Baton Rouge and occupy the little community of Port Hudson along the bluffs of the riverbank, where they will soon build up fortifications and create a new strong point on the Mississippi River from which to transfer troops and supplies between the Western and Trans-Mississippi theaters. Port Hudson will thus become a second Vicksburg on the mighty river and will have to be taken by the Union if their strategic plans to secure the entire Mississippi and split the Confederacy in two are to succeed. With control over Baton Rouge and the Union's foothold in southern Louisiana now firmly established, the Federals can proceed to focus all their efforts on the final stages of the Mississippi River Valley front of the Western Theater, Vicksburg and Port Hudson. However, it will take another year of hard fighting before these key strategic objectives are finally secured.